I'll just um, add my welcome both to Bill and Arif uh, and to all of you. Um, just a few words on format before we get started because, uh, as Ian said, time is of the essence tonight. Um, each speaker is going to be given 20 minutes to make their initial presentation. That will be first Bill and then Arif. Um, Bill, I think, is going to use this uh, uh, PowerPoint presentations uh, to help his uh, presentation. But I hope you've both got, you've all got uh, something from both of them in front of you uh, as an outline of some of their arguments. Um, after they've both had their initial 20-minute presentation, they each will be given 12 minutes for rebuttal. So first again to Bill, then to Arif, and then I'll open the floor for questions. I'm afraid this will be strictly questions, not comments, so you will only get um, 30 seconds to ask your question. So if you're thinking about questions as we go along, please keep them extremely concise. My secret weapon is this gong, <laughs> wow. which I will use to keep the speakers in order initially, and then to keep you as questioners uh, in order after that. Uh, and I'll ask the questions uh, in, in alternate order, as it were, First one for Bill, then one for Arif, and then backwards and forwards like that. So I think we'll go um, straight to it. I will ask Bill to make his uh, initial 20-minute presentation. So over to you, Bill. Good, thank you. Well, good evening. Uh, I am delighted to be here this evening, and I want to begin by thanking Christian Heritage for the invitation to participate in tonight's debate. I find it always a delight to come back to uh, Cambridge University, which in my mind, is the closest thing to a scholar's heaven on earth that I can think of. And I also want to thank Dr. Ahmed for his willingness to join in the discussion this evening. It's my sincere hope that uh, today's debate will be a significant help to you in your own thinking about this most important of questions. So does God exist? Well, in order to answer that question rationally, we've got to address two further questions. First, what good reasons are there to think that God exists? And secondly, what good reasons are there to think that God does not exist? Now, I'll leave it up to Dr. Ahmed to uh, present the arguments against God's existence. But I note that atheists have tried for centuries to disprove the existence of God, but no one's been able to come up with a successful argument. So rather than attack straw men, at this point, I'll just wait to hear Dr. Ahmed's answer to the following question. What good reasons are there to think that atheism is true? Let's look then at the first question. What good reasons are there to think that God exists? Tonight, I'm going to present five arguments in favor of God's existence. Whole books have been written on each one of these, and so all I can do is present a brief sketch of each argument and then go into more detail as Dr. Ahmed responds to them. So, number one, God's existence is implied by the origin of the universe. Have you ever asked yourself where the universe came from? Why everything exists instead of just nothing? Well, typically atheists have just said that the universe is eternal and uncaused. But the idea of a beginningless universe faces uh, severe philosophical and scientific problems. If the universe never had a beginning, that means that the number of past events in the history of the universe is infinite. But mathematicians recognize that the existence of an actually infinite number of things leads to self-contradictions. For example, what is infinity minus infinity? Well, mathematically, you get self-contradictory answers. This shows that infinity is just an idea in your mind, not something that exists in reality. David Hilbert, perhaps the greatest mathematician of the 20th century, writes, the infinite is nowhere to be found in reality. It neither exists in nature nor provides a legitimate basis for rational thought. The role that remains for the infinite to play is solely that of an idea. But that entails that since past events are not just ideas, but are real, the number of past events must be finite. Therefore, the series of past events can't go back forever. Rather, the universe must have begun to exist. This conclusion has been confirmed by remarkable discoveries in astronomy and astrophysics. In one of the most startling developments of modern science, 
we now have pretty strong evidence that the universe is not eternal in the past, but had an absolute beginning about 13 billion years ago in a cataclysmic event known as the Big Bang. What makes the Big Bang so startling is that it represents the origin of the universe from literally nothing. For all matter and energy, even physical space and time themselves, came into being at the Big Bang. As the physicist P.C.W. Davies explains, the coming into being of the universe as discussed in modern science is not just a matter of imposing some sort of organization upon a previous incoherent state, but literally the coming into being of all physical things from nothing. That description holds not only for the standard Big Bang model, but also for quantum gravity models like that of Stephen Hawking. And thus Hawking reports in his book, The Nature of Space and Time, almost everyone now believes that the universe and time itself had a beginning at the Big Bang. Now this tends to be very awkward for the atheist. For as Anthony Kenny of Oxford University urges, a proponent of the Big Bang theory, at least if he is an atheist, must believe that the universe came from nothing and by nothing. But surely that doesn't make sense. For such a conclusion is, in the words of the philosopher of science, Bernhard Kanitscheider, in head-on collision with the most successful ontological commitment in the history of science, namely the metaphysical principle that out of nothing, nothing comes. So, why does the universe exist rather than just nothing? Where did it come from? There must have been a cause which brought the universe into being. Now, we can summarize our argument thus far as follows. One, everything that comes into being has a cause. And two, the universe came into being. From this, it follows logically that three, therefore, the universe has a cause. Now, as the cause of space and time, this being must be an uncaused, timeless, spaceless, immaterial being of unfathomable power. Moreover, I would argue it must be personal as well. Why? Let me give two reasons. First of all, this cause must be greater than the universe. Think of the universe, all of space and time. So the cause of the universe must be beyond space and time. Therefore, it cannot be physical or material. Now, there are only two kinds of things that fit that description, either abstract objects like numbers or else an intelligent mind. But abstract objects can't cause anything. Therefore, it follows that the cause of the universe is a transcendent personal mind. Second reason, how else could a timeless cause give rise to a temporal effect like the universe? If the cause were an impersonal set of necessary and sufficient conditions, then the cause could never exist without its effect. If the cause were permanently present, then the effect would be permanently present as well. The only way for the cause to be timeless and the effect to begin in time is for the cause to be a personal agent who freely chooses to create an effect in time without any prior determining conditions. And thus we're brought not merely to a transcendent cause of the universe, but to its personal creator. Number two, the fine tuning of the universe for intelligent life points to a designer of the cosmos. In recent decades, scientists have been stunned by the discovery that the initial conditions of the Big Bang were fine-tuned for the existence of intelligent life with a precision and delicacy that literally defy human comprehension. This fine-tuning is of two sorts. First, when the laws of nature are expressed as mathematical equations, you find appearing in them certain constants, like the gravitational constant. These constants are not determined by the laws of nature. 
Rather, the laws of nature are consistent with a wide range of values for these constants. Secondly, in addition to these constants, there are certain arbitrary quantities, which are just put in as initial conditions on which the laws of nature operate. For example, the amount of entropy, or the balance between matter and antimatter in the early universe. Now, all of these constants and quantities fall into an extraordinarily narrow range of life-permitting values. Were these constants or quantities to be altered by even a hair's breadth, the life-permitting balance would be destroyed and life would not exist. For example, if the atomic weak force or the force of gravity were altered by as little as one part out of 10 to the 100th power, the universe would not have been life permitting. Now, there are only three possible explanations of this extraordinary fine tuning. The fine tuning of the universe is due to either physical necessity, chance, or design. Now, it can't be due to physical necessity because, as we've seen, the constants and quantities are independent of the laws of nature. So, could the fine tuning be due to chance? Well, the problem with this alternative is that the odds against the fine tunings occurring by accident are so incomprehensibly great that they cannot be reasonably faced. Perhaps an illustration would help. If we imagine the range of possible values for the constants and quantities upon which our existence depends to be as wide as the entire known universe, then the range of life-permitting values is about 2.5 centimeters wide by comparison. The probability that all of the constants and quantities would fall by chance alone into the narrow life-permitting range is vanishingly small. We now know that life-prohibiting universes are vastly more probable than any life-permitting uh, universe like ours. So if the universe were a product of chance, the odds are overwhelming that the universe should be life-prohibiting. Hence, too, the fine-tuning is not due to either physical necessity or chance, but logically that implies three, therefore it is due to design. Thus, the fine-tuning of the universe implies the existence of a designer of the cosmos. Number three, objective moral values are plausibly grounded in God. If God does not exist, then objective moral values do not exist. By objective moral values, I mean values which are valid and binding, whether anybody believes in them or not. Many theists and atheists agree that if God does not exist, then moral values are not objective in this way. For example, Michael Roos, a noted philosopher of science, explains, the, problem, or the position of the modern evolutionist is that morality is a biological adaptation, no less than our hands and feet and teeth. Considered as a rationally justifiable set of claims about an objective something, ethics is illusory. I appreciate that when somebody says, love thy neighbor as thyself, they think they are referring above and beyond themselves. Nevertheless, such reference is truly without foundation. Morality is just an aid to survival and reproduction, and any deeper meaning is illusory. Friedrich Nietzsche, the great 19th century atheist who proclaimed the death of God, understood that the death of God meant the destruction of all meaning and value in life. I think that Friedrich Nietzsche was right. But we've got to be very careful here. The question here is not, must we believe in God in order to live moral lives? I'm not claiming that we must. Nor is the question, can we recognize objective moral values without believing in God? I think that we can. Rather, the question is, if God does not exist, do objective moral values exist? And like Professor Roos, I just don't see any reason to think that in the absence of God, the morality evolved by Homo sapiens is objective. On the atheistic view, some action, say rape, may not be socially advantageous, and so in the course of human development has become taboo. 
But that does absolutely nothing to prove that rape is really wrong. On the atheistic view, there's nothing really wrong with your raping someone. Thus, God does not exist. Objective moral values do not exist. But the problem is that objective values do exist. And deep down, I think we all know it. There's no more reason to deny the objective reality of moral values than the objective reality of the physical world. Actions like rape, cruelty, and child abuse aren't just uh, socially unacceptable behavior. They're moral abominations. Some things, at least, are really wrong. Michael Roos himself admits the man who says that it is morally acceptable to rape little children is just as mistaken as the man who says two plus two equals five. Similarly, love, equality, and self-sacrifice are really good. Hence, I think we all know, too, objective values do exist. But then it follows logically and inescapably that three, therefore, God exists. Number four, the historical facts concerning the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. The historical person, Jesus of Nazareth, was a remarkable individual. New Testament critics have reached something of a consensus that the historical Jesus came on the scene with an unprecedented sense of divine authority, the authority to stand and speak in God's place. He claimed that in himself the kingdom of God had come. And as visible demonstrations of this fact, he carried out a ministry of miracle working and exorcisms. But the supreme confirmation of his claim was his resurrection from the dead. If Jesus really did rise from the dead, then it would seem that we have a divine miracle on our hands, and thus evidence for the existence of God. Now, most people would probably think that the resurrection of Jesus is something you just take by faith or deny. Uh, but actually, I believe there are three established facts which are recognized by the majority of New Testament historians today, which are best explained by the resurrection of Jesus. Fact number one, on the Sunday following his crucifixion, Jesus' tomb was found empty by a group of his women followers. According to Jakob Kramer, an Austrian specialist in the historical study of Jesus, by far most scholars hold firmly to the reliability of the biblical statements concerning the empty tomb. Fact number two, on separate occasions, different individuals and groups of people saw appearances of Jesus alive after his death. According to the prominent New Testament critic Gerald Ludemann, it may be taken as historically certain that the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. These appearances were witnessed not only by believers, but also by skeptics, uh, unbelievers, and even enemies. Finally, fact number three, the original disciples suddenly came to believe in the resurrection of Jesus despite every predisposition to the contrary. You see, Jews had no belief in a dying, much less rising, Messiah. And Jewish beliefs about the afterlife prohibited anyone's rising from the dead prior to the general resurrection at the end of the world. Nevertheless, the original disciples came to believe so strongly that God had raised Jesus from the dead that they were willing to die for the truth of that belief. N.T. Wright, an eminent British New Testament scholar, concludes, that is why, as an historian, I cannot explain the rise of early Christianity unless Jesus rose again, leaving an empty tomb behind him. Attempts to explain away these three great facts, like uh, the disciples stole the body or Jesus wasn't really dead, have been universally rejected by contemporary scholarship. The simple fact is that there just is no plausible naturalistic explanation of these facts. And therefore, it seems to me, the Christian is amply justified in believing that Jesus rose from the dead and was who he claimed to be. But that entails that God exists. And thus we have a good inductive argument for the existence of God based on the resurrection of Jesus. Number one, there are three established facts about Jesus. The discovery of his empty tomb, his post-mortem appearances, and the origin of the disciples' belief in his resurrection. Two, the hypothesis God raised Jesus from the dead 
is the best explanation of these facts. Three, the hypothesis God raised Jesus from the dead entails that God exists. Four, therefore, God exists. Finally, number five, you can experience God personally. This isn't really an argument for God's existence. Rather, it's the claim that you can know that God exists wholly apart from arguments, simply by immediately experiencing him. This was the way people in the Bible knew God. As Professor John Hick explains, God was known to them as a dynamic will interacting with their own wills, a sheer given reality, as inescapably to be reckoned with as destructive storm or life-giving sunshine. To them, God was not an idea adopted by the mind, but an experienced reality which gave significance to their lives. Now, if this is the case, then there's a real danger that arguments for God's existence could actually distract you from God himself. If you're sincerely seeking God, then God will make his existence evident to you. The Bible promises, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. We mustn't so concentrate on the external proofs that we fail to hear the inner voice of God speaking to our own hearts. For those who listen, God becomes an immediate reality in their lives. In conclusion, then, we've seen five reasons to think that God exists. If Arif wants us to believe atheism instead, then he must first tear down all five of the reasons that I've presented and then in their place erect a case of his own to prove that atheism is true. Unless and until he does that, I think that belief in God is the more plausible worldview. Um, thank you very much, Bill. I'm now going to call on Arif to um, give his presentation. Uh, so over to you, Arif. You have um, 20 minutes as well. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Yes? And has everybody got a handout? Anybody hasn't? Are there any spare ones? Could you pass them along, please? Thank you. I think we're out of handouts. I think you brought 150, and I think we've exceeded the number. Unless you've got okay. any spare ones. Okay, no. Thank you. I do apologize. The handout is in any case not necessary for the bulk of the first half of this part of my presentation. Um, and I'll try to make the second half as clear as I can. Okay, well, I have to begin by thanking everybody involved in this. Um, I want to thank uh, Michael here for chairing the debate, and I want to thank Dr. Craig for coming and so graciously giving the talk that he did. And I also want to thank Ian Cooper, who is behind the impetus for this project. And I want to thank all of you for coming. Now, we're discussing, and presumably this is the reason you're here, we're discussing probably the most important question that any of us will have to face in our life. If what Dr. Craig says is true, if God exists, then you and I should change our lives. If I really believed what Dr. Craig believes, not going through the motions, not having tea with the vicar on Sunday, but if I really believed it, then I would change my life. This, therefore, is a very serious matter, and that fact I think, has two consequences. The first one is that I don't really want to come here and convince you in half an hour or 40 minutes of talk so that you go and think, oh, silly me, of course, God doesn't exist. The most important thing I want, and what I think will be the measure of success, and I hope that Dr. Craig agrees with this, is that you should all think about it for yourself. Don't think about what somebody else has told you. Don't think about what you were taught at Sunday school or what your teacher tells you or anything like that, think about the matter for yourself and come to your own decision. The second consequence is given the importance of the matter we're discussing, I want to hear serious arguments. I want to hear reasons for believing in God. I honestly believe and I honestly believe this could be said of most of you today, that if I actually heard good reasons for believing in God's existence, then I would change my mind about it. 
And if I didn't hear good reasons, then I wouldn't. That indeed is why I think we're here. If we have beliefs which are not based on reasons, then we'd be wasting our time. And this brings me to the first thing that I find slightly puzzling about Dr. Craig. Ian said at the beginning of his introduction that Dr. Craig is a counterexample to the thesis that Christians do not think. Well, let me quote you a passage from a book of Dr. Craig's. This book is called Reasonable Faith, and the passage I'm quoting is from page 37. In fact, there are three passages, all from this page. The first one says, As long as reason is minister of the Christian faith, Christians should adhere to it. Now, minister in this context means servant. So what Dr. Craig is saying is that Christians should believe their reason just so long as it serves the end of the Christian faith. What's the second passage? The second passage says this, we can know the truth whether we have rational arguments or not. And the third passage, again from the same page, says, even though we are given no good reason to believe and many persuasive reasons to disbelieve, even then, the disbeliever has no excuse because the ultimate reason he does not believe is that he has rejected deliberately God's Holy Spirit. Now, it seems to me, if you take those three passages seriously, then Dr. Craig must think that we are wasting our time tonight. Because tonight, I thought we were inquiring into the question, what reasons are there for believing in God? Dr. Craig's position, however, seems to be that it doesn't matter whether there are reasons. We don't have to think that there are any rational arguments for believing in God. And somebody who is persuaded by reason, somebody who's persuaded by the evidence, even he has got it wrong. So I very much hope Dr. Craig will be able to tell us later on tonight why he thinks we're not all wasting our time being here. Now, I started off by saying that this is a very serious matter, and if what Dr. Craig says is true, then I'm going to change my life. And what that means is that I need to hear serious arguments. This is not an academic word game. This is not just fun. This is not the kind of thing you have chatting over a sherry in the SCR. <laughs> no. This is a serious question, and therefore I want to hear serious arguments. A student said to me a couple of days ago, I expect you're very anxious about this debate. And I said, why? Why should I be anxious? And she said, well, you know, Dr. Craig will probably have some very strong arguments. And I thought, well, I'm not anxious about that at all. I actually want to hear the strongest arguments he's got. I want to hear the very strongest arguments there are for believing in God. It matters that much to me. So what are these strong, serious arguments? What are these arguments for changing my life? Well, the first one, I've written some of these down. So the first one, Dr. Craig told us that the universe must have had a beginning because there can be no actual infinite. And there can't be an actual infinite because if you take infinity minus infinity, you get a contradiction. Now, as I said, I'm not here to play meaningless word games, and I'm afraid that that is a meaningless word game. It's perfectly true that as far as what are called cardinal numbers are understood, the notion of minus and plus isn't well defined. That doesn't mean the notion of infinity is contradictory. It certainly doesn't mean the universe had to have a beginning. It's very easy to refute this part of Dr. Craig's position. It could be true that before every event that took place, there was another one. That makes perfectly good sense. And if it were true, there's no first event. There's nothing for God to cause. Let me repeat that. Every event follows another one. I hope Dr. Craig can tell us later on tonight which of those five words he doesn't understand. But then he tells us, Modern physics confirms that the universe had a cause. 
Again, this is simply a misleading distortion. Some physicists, it's true, many I expect, think that time itself began about 15 billion years ago. Does that mean that there was some time before the universe began? When the cause of the universe, this person, was hanging around waiting to bring it about? No, it doesn't. All that it means is that at every time the universe existed, and there was no time before the universe existed. There was no time in which God could have acted. But let's suppose he's right about that. He's not, but let's suppose that he is. Does this mean that this being, or this cause of the universe, was a person? No, of course it doesn't. Dr. Craig gives two arguments for thinking it was a person. The first one is that it can't be physical, and the only non-physical things he knows of are abstract objects in human minds. It can't be an abstract object, therefore it was a human mind. Now this is based on a philosophical view that was popular in the 17th century, known as Cartesian dualism, which is the view that human minds are not physical objects, and are not dependent in some sense on physical processes. I hesitate to appeal to authority, but given the brevity of time that I have, I will have to, and say that the naivety of this view today is very well documented and needs no further comment from me. The second argument that Dr. Craig gives is that the cause of the universe, because it was eternal or outside time, must have been a person. If it wasn't, if it was a physical or you know, non-personal thing, how could it be just hanging around, waiting to cause things? Well, it seems to me that all the persons and person-like things I know act in time. I've certainly never come across a physical thing that is outside of time, but I've never come across a person either that is outside of time. So perhaps Dr. Craig would like to give us a better reason for thinking that this object, which he still hasn't proved to exist, is indeed anything like a person. And even if it was a person, why should we think that this very same being that created the universe then hung around doing nothing for 15 billion years and then suddenly starts parceling out real estate and impregnating virgins? If Dr. Craig could give us a reason to believe that, I'd go away much happier tonight. Okay, now let's move on. Dr. Craig tells us that it's incredibly unlikely that these physical constants, which he says determine the beginning of the universe, permit life. I'm moving on now, if you want to look at Dr. Craig's handout, to the what's called the fine-tuning argument. But what I want to know in answer to that question is where on earth he gets these probabilities from. Where on earth the idea comes from that it's incredibly unlikely that we should live in a life-permitting universe. Imagine somebody tossing a coin and it lands heads. And I say, wow, that's amazing. It must have been fixed. It was incredibly unlikely to land heads. Now, that's absurd. You say, why? And I say, well, there's millions of things it could have done. It could have landed on its side. It could have gone up into space and never come back. It could have turned into an elephant. It could have just vanished. There's millions of things it could have done. So it's millions and millions to one that it landed heads. Now, that would be really stupid. But what I'm saying is that I've plucked the probabilities out of thin air in that case, and I say Dr. Craig has plucked these probabilities out of thin air in this case. Now, in saying what they are, he's hidden behind authority, but given how important this question is, I'm sure he's taken the trouble to work them out for himself. I'm sure he's taken the trouble to find out what the evidence is for assigning these probabilities. So I'd like to hear that tonight. Then we have the argument from moral objectivity. I'll come back to this in the next round and hopefully in the questions, but I will briefly discuss it now. Dr. Craig tells us that we need God if there are to be moral, objective moral values. Now, there's two things I want to say about that very briefly. The first thing is that if there are any objective moral values, I know that murdering innocent people is wrong. I know that laying siege to a town and slaughtering all its inhabitants is wrong. That's why I think Srebrenica was wrong. If moral objective values come from the God that Dr. Craig believes in, 
then that's right. Just look in the book of Joshua. What does he say? Kill everybody except the whore who lives in that town and protected by messengers. So it looks like, if we do think moral obje- objective moral values come from God, it looks like we should say Srebrenica was all right. In any case, what reason is there for thinking there are objective moral values? There must be a good argument for this. After all, there are no objective aesthetic values, quite plausibly, so Dr. Craig must give us an argument for saying there are objective moral ones. What is the argument? Well, it was striking, so I wrote it down. He said, there are objective moral values because deep down we know there are. That's it. That's the argument. Now, that may pass for an argument in Talbot Theological College, It may indeed pass for an argument in the White House. But but this is is Cambridge, and it doesn't pass for an argument here. (laughs) Next we have the resurrection. Oh, yes. Now, this is a really extraordinary claim. We're told that we have huge amounts of evidence for saying that Jesus was raised from the dead and taken up into heaven. I just want to make two points about this. The first one is that if you have such an extraordinary claim as that, you're going to want pretty strong evidence. Hearsay is not going to be enough. Eyewitness testimony from about 1,500 people might just about do it. But then 1,500 people saw David Copperfield make the Statue of Liberty vanish. Nobody thinks it really did. Second point, of course, is that the source of evidence is pretty suspect. Let me give you one example from the Gospels. Matthew chapter 27, when Jesus died, there was an earthquake. Matthew chapter 28, when Jesus died, the undead started walking the streets. Now, Mark is the earliest Gospel. None of this is in Mark. If our sources start contradicting themselves in this way, you might just start to wonder whether anything they say is true. Now, the last argument Dr. Craig gives, he actually admits is not an argument at all. This is the argument, so-called argument, from experience. I'll just give an analogy for that. Suppose that you saw a donkey appearing on stage right here, okay? Well, that would be rather strange, but you might say, okay, well, maybe there's a donkey. But now suppose that the person next to you said, oh no, it isn't a donkey, it's a pig. And suppose there are lots of other people in the corner who said, no, it's a horse. And so there's, suppose there's a whole lot of people over here who said they saw nothing at all. Now in that case, I think you would be pretty sensible to doubt your experience. You would be pretty sensible to think, well actually, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm not really seeing a donkey. But now this is the position with so-called religious experience. With religious experience, you have a large number of groups of people, all of whom claim to have experience, and all of whom claim to have experience of different truths. Surely the right thing to say then is, maybe it's not a donkey, maybe I'm wrong, maybe I should see an optician. This is not what Dr. Craig is saying. Dr. Craig is saying, it's definitely a donkey. So I want to ask him, and I hope he can tell us tonight, why is everybody else wrong? Why are all the Jews and the Muslims and the Sikhs and the Hindus and the atheists wrong for having different religious experiences for you? Of course, he admits this isn't an argument, so I won't press him too much to return to it. I turn now to my arguments for not believing in God. And as I say, I must apologise for the fact that there are more people than Hamlet's. I basically have three arguments. The first one really depended on Dr. Craig, but he obliged, so that's fine. The argument was this. It was based on something that Barclay said, George Barclay, who was a bishop, as many of you will know. Barclay said that if you don't have a reason to believe in something, that's a reason not to believe in it. We've got no reason to believe in the tooth fairy. We've got no reason to believe in leprechauns. We've got no reason to believe in Krishna or Allah. We've got no reason to believe in any of these supernatural things. Those are reasons not to believe in them. The same is true of the God that Dr. Craig believes in. 
So the feebleness of Dr. Craig's arguments is itself an argument in my favour. And I claim they are feeble. The second argument is very well known. It's the argument from evil, perhaps best presented in a 1980s book by the great philosopher, the excellent philosopher, John Mackey. This argument is very simple. It says that there are some things that are gratuitously harmful. There are some things that did harm and never did anyone any good at all. A favourite example of people, and one that I'm going to use, is the First World War. In the First World War, millions of young men, younger than me, younger than most of you, died agonising deaths from poison gas. I was unlucky enough once to breathe chlorine for a few seconds, and it was literally, it, it was a gut-wrenching experience. It was horrible. I can't begin to imagine what it must have been like to die from being gassed. Now, if God's benevolent, couldn't he have made their suffering just a little bit less? And if he's so powerful, couldn't he have made their suffering just a little bit less without making anybody else suffer in recompense? Well, he didn't. So either he couldn't or he wouldn't. If he couldn't, he's impotent, or at least not as powerful as the God Christians believe in. If he wouldn't, he's either stupid or wicked. It seems to me that any reasonable view of the history of the world would give us far better reason for thinking that Satan is in charge around these parts, not Jehovah. My final argument, then, is, in a sense, the opposite of Dr. Craig's argument concerning objectivity, moral objectivity. And this is the argument that genuine belief in God, not, as I said, tea with the vicar, but genuine belief in God, actually warps our moral views. It actually makes us think that things are right, which only a sick pervert would think are right, is right. I gave you an example in the handout, which was this. The example was that in the Iran-Iraq war, children would be sent to walk across minefields by the Iranian government. And the mullahs who sent them would give them little plastic keys and say, you walk across the minefield and if you get blown up, it'll be great because these keys are the keys to paradise. It's not just Islam. Israel and Christians have done this too. The Israeli Defense Force bombs schools, murders children, bulldozes hospitals for a small piece of land simply on religious grounds. Now this is all sick for me. It's not just wrong, it's sick. But if you believe in a God who gives us an afterlife, then there is nothing wrong with it at all. What is wrong with removing somebody from this veil of tears, especially if you make them a martyr? You're doing them a service. As I said on the handout, Harold Shipman, Fred West, Hitler, Stalin himself, they're no worse than somebody who fast-forwards through the video, through the trailers on the video, so you get to the film. Now, I don't think any of you actually believe that in your hearts. I think you agree with me. So it seems that I've run out of time. It seems that I've demolished all of Dr. Craig's arguments, unless he has something to say about that which I'm sure he will, and I've given you three easy reasons not to believe in God. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much indeed, Arif. You've uh, opened up an extremely lively debate. I'm extremely grateful to you for that. Now, the procedure is that uh, each party has 12 minutes now to respond to what the other person has said. So we're going to ask Bill first to speak for 12 minutes, and then we're going to ask Arif if he would like to respond again for 12 minutes. And after that, we're going to open up to questions. So, Bill first, 12 minutes. Well, thank you, Arif, for that very lively and vigorous response to my arguments. I see we're going to be in for a good debate tonight. Let me turn first to his three arguments for atheism before I redefend my own arguments for theism. He argues first that the burden of proof is upon the theist, so if the theist's arguments fail to prove that God exists, 
it follows that God does not exist. This is simply an elementary logical fallacy. Uh, as Kai Nielsen, the atheist philosopher, uh, points out in his book, Reason and Practice, and I quote, to show that an argument is invalid or unsound is not to show that the conclusion of the argument is false. All the proofs of God's existence may fail, but it may still be the case that God exists. In short, to show that the proofs do not work is not enough by itself. It may still be the case that God exists. So Dr. Ahmed needs to offer positive arguments if he's to support atheism. Otherwise, we're at worst left with simply agnosticism, which is uh, not uh, the dis disbelief in the existence of God that he's defending this evening. Second, what about the problem of gratuitous evil in the world? I think it's extremely important that we distinguish here between the emotional problem of evil and what I'll call the intellectual problem of evil. Certainly, the pain and suffering in the world are a tremendous emotional obstacle to belief in God. But that doesn't mean that this is a good intellectual argument against God's existence. However difficult emotionally suffering in the world might make it to believe in God, I'm convinced that it is not ultimately a good uh, objection to God's existence. First of all, this argument from evil depends upon the assumption that we have no good reasons to think that God exists. But atheists recognize that if you have good reasons to think that God exists, then you have good reasons to think that the suffering in the world is not, in fact, pointless. So evil is a problem only for a person who has no good reason to believe in God. But I've given five reasons why I think God exists, uh, and therefore I don't think the argument from evil can even get off the ground if those are good arguments. But suppose I'm wrong and that we have no good reason to think that God exists. Will the argument against God from evil still go through? Well, I, I don't think so. You see, the premise that pointless suffering exists or gratuitous evil exists is extremely controversial. We are simply not in a good position to make these kind of inductive probability judgments. As William Alston, the prominent philosopher of the University of Syracuse, points out, there are cognitive limitations on us which make it impossible in principle for us to say that of some evil that enters our life or that we observe that God has no morally sufficient reason for permitting this. Take just one example, our limitations in time and space. God sees the end of history from the beginning and achieves his purposes through the actions of human free creatures. And it may well be the case that God has to put up with a multitude of natural and moral evils along the way in order to arrive at his ultimate purposes. And therefore, we are simply incapable, limited as we are in our limited framework, of saying with any kind of confidence that God does not have a morally sufficient reason for permitting this or that evil. Alston concludes it is in principle impossible for us to be justified in supposing that God does not have sufficient reasons for permitting evil. But moreover, the premise that he assumes that if God exists, pointless suffering does not exist is also controversial. Maybe only in a world containing pointless suffering would the maximum number of people come to freely know God and his salvation and find eternal life. You see, the reason we tend to think that God would prevent pointless suffering is because we tend to think that if God exists, his purpose for us in life is to be happy in this life. But on the Christian view, that is simply false. We are not God's pets, and the purpose of life is not happiness in this life. Rather, it is to find the knowledge of God which will ultimately lead to human fulfillment and eternal life. And it may well be the case that many evils in the world, like the First World War, are ultimately gratuitous with respect to producing human happiness in this life. But that doesn't prove that they are gratuitous with respect to producing God's overall goal of bringing the maximum number of people freely into a love relationship with himself and ultimately into eternal life. The atheist would have to show that there is a world that is feasible for God in which less suffering exists, but a greater amount of people come to know him and find eternal life than the actual world. And that is sheer speculation. Finally, I want to point out that evil itself actually proves that God exists. It, the argument would go like this. If God does not exist, objective moral values do not exist. He admitted that point in his first speech. Secondly, evil exists. He admitted that in his first speech. It follows from that that objective moral values exist. That is, some things are really evil. Therefore, it follows that God exists. 
So far from actually disproving God's existence, evil actually ultimately proves that God exists because in the absence of God, evil as such would not exist. Finally, he suggests that belief in God leads to perverted moral values. Now, the irony about this is that he can't make that judgment but he, because he doesn't believe objective moral values exist. He cannot condemn these things or say that they are sick or perverse because on an atheistic view, there are no objective moral values. Whatever uh, anyone decides to do, uh, whether it's uh, in a society or culture of Islam or Christianity or whatever, all things are permitted. So uh, I don't think he can even make these sorts of moral judgments on the basis of his atheistic philosophy. In any case, human perversity uh, of, in misusing religion in no way proves that God doesn't exist. It would just prove that human beings perversely use uh, religion for their own evil purposes. It's not at all a disproof of God's existence. So I think these arguments for atheism are, are far from compelling. Now what about my arguments for theism? Let's look at the first one based on the origin of the universe. He accused me of playing a word game with infinity. He said minus is not well defined with regard to infinite transfinite numbers. This is no word game, uh, uh, my friends. The uh, reason it's not well defined is because subtraction leads to self-contradictions. But if you have an infinite number of things in reality, see an infinite number of coins or uh, marbles, then you can perform subtraction with them. You can slap the, num the hand of the mathematician who tries to subtract uh, transfinite numbers, but you can't stop people from subtracting coins or, or marbles if they exist. And that's why people like David Hilbert says the actual infinite doesn't exist in reality, and that implies necessarily that there cannot be an infinite number of past events. With respect to the Big Bang, he said, well, there was no time uh, before the Big Bang. That's exactly right. That was my point. Time and space come into beginning at the uh, existence of the Big Bang. As Barrow and Tipler, the physicists, point out in their book Anthropic Cosmological Principle, at this singularity, space and time came into existence. Literally nothing existed before the singularity. So if the orig or universe originated at such a singularity, we would truly have a creation out of nothing. And so I think we've got good philosophical and uh, scientific evidence for that key premise that the universe began to exist. And that implies that therefore there must be a transcendent cause of the universe. Now he said, you can't have a transcendent person because dualism is naive and I don't even need to refute it. Well, that's far too slick. Uh, the fact is that there are many fine uh, philosophers today who believe in the existence of mind. Uh, just to name a couple, Karl Popper and Sir John Eccles, one of the greatest uh, philosophers of science of the 20th century and a Nobel Prize winning neurologist. In their book, The Mind and Its Brain, defend interactionism, dualism. Indeed, if my argument is correct, it's an argument for dualism. It's an argument that there can be independent uh, minds. So he's got to do more than that to, to deny it. He says, well, why think that this cause is the Christian God? Well, that is my argument based on the resurrection of Jesus that suggests this being has revealed himself in Christ. So I think this first argument goes unrefuted. Both of the premises uh, are uh, unrefuted in the, in the case tonight. What about the argument from fine-tuning? Here he doesn't deny premise two that the fine tuning can't be explained by chance or natural necessity, but he simply says there uh, isn't any fine tuning. He denies it. Well, here I want to quote simply from Martin Rees, who is of the uh, uh, Institute of Astronomy here in Cambridge and the Astronomer Royal of Great Britain. He says the laws governing our universe appear to be finely tuned for our existence everywhere you look. There are yet more examples. Wherever physicists look, they see examples of fine-tuning. You can't escape this argument by trying to deny that fine-tuning exists. I gave specific examples, and these probabilities are calculated by calculating the range of values that are possible with the life-permitting range. And as I say, it's fantastically improbable that they would all fall in the life-permitting range. What about the existence of objective moral values? Here he says, well, you gave no good argument for objective moral values. My argument is that you reflect on your own moral experience. This is the way in which ethicists do moral theory. In uh, his essay in Philosophical Perspectives, the non-Christian uh, ethicist, Walter Sinnott Armstrong says, the most common way to choose among moral theories is to test how well they cohere with our intuitions or consider judgments about what is morally right and wrong about the nature or ideal of a person, and about the purposes of morality. 
So I simply ask you to reflect on the fact. Do you think that torturing a child for fun is wrong? Do you think that that is objectively morally wrong? The atheist cannot say that because in the absence of God, we're just animals. And these kinds of activities go on all the time in the animal kingdom. So if you believe with me that there are indeed objective moral values, it follows logically that God exists. And note, you can't even judge against things like the slaughter of the Canaanites or these, these other things that he says are sick unless you presuppose some objective standard of morality. What about the resurrection of Jesus? Here he uh, disputes Matthew's story of the resurrection of the saints in Matthew 27. But that's just bad historical methodology. Even if I grant that were unhistorical, Matthew's editorial addition to the Mark and account does nothing to disprove the Mark and account. And that's why most New Testament historians recognize those three facts that I mentioned. And if he disagrees with the majority of experts on this area, he needs to give us good reasons why. As for his argument that the resurrection would require extraordinary evidence, well, I think we do have pretty good evidence for this. But moreover, this is simply a fallacious argument. Uh, uh, the uh, existence of the resurrection doesn't require extraordinary evidence if the resurrection itself is not highly improbable. And I don't think there's any uh, theory of probability which would show that the hypothesis, God raised Jesus from the dead, is improbable. What's improbable is that Jesus rose naturally from the dead. But the hypothesis that God raised Jesus from the dead is not at all improbable, I think. And therefore, I think, given the evidence for the empty tomb, the post-mortem appearances, and the origin of the Christian faith, we have very good grounds for believing that Jesus did rise from the dead and was who he claimed to be. Finally, what about the experience of God? He says, well, there are other experiences, counterfeit experiences. The fact of non-veridical experiences doesn't do anything to invalidate the veridicality of a genuine experience. And so I don't see any reason to think that my experience of God is false. Pointing to someone else's experience and saying that's non-veridical doesn't do anything to show my experience is false. So it seems to me that in the absence of good arguments for atheism, I'm perfectly just, uh, justified in believing in God on the basis of his reality in my life today. Thank you, Bill. And we're going to turn now um, back to Arif to uh, have, a, have his second round of uh, 12 minutes to respond to that. So over to you, Arif. Thank you very much. Can you all hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay, well, I'll just begin by saying very quickly that unless I misheard him, Dr. Craig didn't return to answering the question with which I began, which was, why does he not think we're all wasting our time? I quoted a passage from a book by Dr. Craig where he said that in the end of the day, reason doesn't matter. He still hasn't addressed that point. Now, to turn to some of the things that Dr. Craig does address, let's go through some of them. He started off by saying that my burden of proof argument, as he fairly enough called it, uh, rested on a straightforward logical fallacy. And the idea was that just because an argument isn't sound, just because its premises aren't true or the conclusion doesn't follow from the premises, that doesn't show that the conclusion is false. Of course, that fact of logic is not in dispute. But that's true about any statement. That's true about the statement, there is a tooth fairy. That's true about the statement, there are leprechauns. If I can show that we have no more reason to believe in God than we have to believe in leprechauns, or if Dr. Craig can't show that to be false, then that's all I care about showing. I don't believe in leprechauns. I don't believe in the tooth fairy. Neither do any of you. What I want to know is whether there's any better reason for believing in God. The second point, and this comes to the argument from evil, as I put it, um, Dr. Craig raised the objection, um, and this strikes me as slightly strange, but Dr. Craig did raise the objection that we can never actually know whether the harm that happened was good or evil. We can never actually know whether what happened in the First World War, for example, was at the end of the day the best thing. Now, just think for a minute what this means. As I said, this is not an academic parlor game. It's very easy, especially for academics, who, unless they try, have very little exposure to the real world, it's very easy to lose sight of the distinction between opening your mouth and saying something as part of a game and actually meaning it. 
what Dr. Craig is telling us is that the Holocaust, for example, is something of which we can't say whether it was for the best. For all we know, we should suspend judgment as to whether the Nazi Holocaust was at the end of the day for the best. Now I hope you want to think about that before you start saying something like that. Okay, the next point was that um, supposedly God couldn't adjust these things because they're so intricately bound to their effects. The idea was that God, if he were to change certain events which involved harm, that would redound to certain other events and at the end of the day people wouldn't uh, have the experiences or the values that he thinks they should have. The example that he gives is the idea that if you do believe that there are some goods outside of this life, as well as goods in this life, then for all we know, the harm that I call gratuitous actually redounds at the end of the day to our having a better next life. Now that argument, of course, is completely question-begging and circular in this context. The whole issue is whether God exists. The whole issue is whether there's an afterlife. We can't start by assuming that there is one and then saying, well, if you assume there is, then this argument doesn't work. We have to start by not assuming anything of the sort and then if the argument has some plausibility, we should realise that Dr. Uh, Craig's conclusions accordingly have less plausibility. I move on now to the second the argument I gave concerning uh, the idea that religious belief would move our moral values. And here Dr. Craig believes he's caught me in a bind because he says that, well, I said I don't believe in objective moral values, so how can I say, for example, that sending Iranian children across a minefield is objectively wrong? I needn't say anything of the sort. As far as this argument goes, all I need to say is the following. Even if I didn't believe in objective moral values, what I do know is this, if there are objective moral values, they aren't ones that are going to make something like that right. So if God exists, those things are objectively right. Therefore, God doesn't exist. Okay. Now let me turn to the uh, cosmological arguments, as they're called. These are arguments concerning the beginning of the universe. Um, I'll just start by saying again, I asked Dr. Craig, I issued a challenge to him to tell me which of those five words, every event followed another one, which of those five words he didn't understand. I'm still waiting for an answer because I haven't heard where the contradiction is in that. Indeed, anybody who knows anything about transfinite arithmetic will know that the notion of minus and plus is indeed defined perfectly well and in a natural way for numbers that are called ordinals, even though it's not defined for numbers that are called cardinals. But I can excuse Dr. Craig for not understanding this because his training is not in mathematics. Okay, now, the next argument was that this is concerning uh, my claim that there's no reason to think the creator of the universe was a person. Dr. Craig quotes Popper and Eccles uh, as people who are dualists and says that it's rather slick of me to say that dualism is obviously a naive view. Well, of course, it may be true that Popper and Eccles don't believe in the materialism that I find attractive, for example. Nevertheless, it's also true that Popper and Eccles, being scientifically minded, believe that whatever human minds are, they are dependent upon, even if not identical with, physical matter. That claim is enough, I claim, to say that Dr. Craig still hasn't given us any reason to think that whatever it was that created the universe, this non-physical entity, was anything like a human mind. Okay, we come now to the teleological or fine-tuning argument. Uh, this is the argument uh, which, if you recall, is that it's incredibly unlikely that we should be living in a life-permitting universe. Um, and I'd just like to say a little bit about this. Dr. Craig, again, resorted to two tactics. One of them was appeal to authority. The other one was appeal to metaphor. What I would like to know is whether there are any good empirical reasons whatever for assigning one probability rather than another to saying that the, fine the so-called fine-tuned constants have the value that they do. What did he say? Again, I wrote it down. He said that we work out the probability by considering the range of possibilities and then finding out the proportion of that range occupied by life-permitting universes. I can do that with a coin. There is a whole range of logical possibilities. It's logically possible that the coin should vanish. It's logically possible that the coin should turn into an elephant. It's logically possible that the coin should land on its side. I can make 10 million logically possible scenarios in which the coin doesn't land heads. So by Dr. Craig's argument, 
we should be just as amazed that coin lands, coins land heads as we should be that the universe exists. Okay, I move on now to the issue concerning objective moral values. Really, this is very simple, um, and I don't see what the dispute is at all. There are two points here. The first point is that if there are objective moral values, it would be absurd to think that they're grounded in God. It would be absurd to, absurd to think, whatever objective moral values are, that they are ones that make a variety of things right. Let's consider what these things are. Destruction of towns, rape, murder, the killing of people for the practice of homosexuality. If there are objective moral values, they aren't things that they make those things right. And second, I can perfectly well say that it's as wrong as you like to rape children or whatever other examples Dr. Craig gave without thinking that they are in some sense objective. I can value things as much as I like without thinking that they are in some magical or metaphysical sense objective. Those two claims come quite sharply apart and Dr. Craig again is merely playing with our emotions by using particularly distasteful examples as he does. Then we come on to the issue concerning the resurrection. One point that I must apologise to Dr. Craig for not bringing up earlier on, uh, simply because I forgot, was simply to dispute his claim that the resurrection is, as he says, unique in Judaic history. The res resurrection is no such thing. I'm not a biblical scholar, as is probably evident by now, um, but I can think off the top of my head of two examples of resurrection in the Old Testament. There's one of them, which is in the first book of Kings, chapter 17, when Elijah resurrects, Elijah resurrects a child. And the other one is in the first book of Samuel, as I call it, the first book of Samuel, which is the famous Witch of Endor passage. So it seems to me to be false that resurrection occupies quite the unique place that Dr. Craig says it does. However, he also seemed not quite to grasp what I was saying about reasons for thinking that we should have extraordinary evidence for this. Uh, so I'll just try and make it a little bit more graphic. I read a newspaper on Sundays called The News of the World. It's my favourite newspaper. And in it, there's a column called Captain Cash. And what he does is people write into him with various claims. They say, oh, this has happened. Can you send me some money, Captain Cash? So somebody might write saying, oh, Captain Cash, my blind one-legged granny was mugged and they stole her crutches. Can you send me £100 for some more? And he'll write back saying, yes. Usually he makes a pun, so he'll say, you know, I'll stump up the cash or something like that. <laughs> That's why I like reading it. <laughs> Well, what sometimes happens is that people send in requests which are absurd. And usually, when they send in absurd requests, they end up asking for more money as well. And when that happens, of course, Captain Cash gets a little bit suspicious. Usually, you see, you have to send in a police report and a photograph and so on. Once somebody sent in a letter saying, Dear Captain Cash, my neighbour's a witch and she turned my car into a frog. Can you send me a thousand pounds for a new one? And now, in a case like that, it's no good just sending a photograph of a frog and an ugly woman <laughs> with captions saying frog and uh, car and neighbour on it, which is basically what this guy did. Captain Cash was obviously not impressed. He said to hop it or something like that. <laughs> now, imagine somebody wrote to Captain Cash and said, Dear Captain Cash, a man was raised from the dead 2,000 years ago and I need to tell everybody about it. Give me everything you've got. What do you think Captain Cash would say to that? Go to hell, that's what he'd say. <laughs> This argument, of course, as we know, is due to Hume. Um, and the argument that I've given is simply a, slightly, a modern update of Hume's argument. Now, finally, we get to the argument from experience. Dr. Craig actually came out and admitted, so I admire him for his honesty, he came out and admitted that all the religious experiences of the Jews, the Muslims, the Hindus, the Sikhs, the Buddhists, and the atheists, they're all wrong. All these people are wrong. So perhaps Dr. Craig could give us a reason not something deep down, a reason for thinking that the vast majority of the world's population who have had religious experiences have got it wrong and he's got it right. It's simply question begging to say that these other experiences are non-veridical, these other experiences are false, so that doesn't cast any doubt on my experience. Just think of the donkey case. 
Isn't it sensible to say, in the donkey case, maybe I'm wrong, maybe I should change my mind. And it's not either as if different people have different experiences of the same thing. As I'm sure Dr. Craig would agree, Christians and Jews disagree fundamentally. Christians and Muslims disagree fundamentally. All three of them disagree fundamentally with Buddhists, for example. They have incompatible experiences. Only one of them can be true. And I think I've given you reason for saying that it's mine. Thanks very much. and authoritarian and ruthless or something like that uh, in order to keep this in order I think um, but the rules are that you have 30 seconds to give us your question and then there will be two minutes to the person to whom it's addressed and one minute for the other person to respond before we go to another question the first question will go to Bill the second question will go to Arif and we will go to and fro until we run out of time so I hope that's clear so if we could have the first, if people who would like to ask a question in 30 seconds to um, Bill, putting up their hands first, I will take the first question which will go to Bill. I think uh, you were over here first. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that's great. Right to ask, since you think uh, uh, morality is based on some kind of objective yardstick, how do you then explain the many uh, instances of human forces around the world in the past and today, and in some cases individuals in Western societies as well, Yeah. So is it easy to explain by saying it's a combination of genetics and cult culture and upbringing? Yes. We mustn't confuse moral epistemology, which is how one comes to know moral values, with moral ontology, which is whether or not these moral values are real and objective. To say that there are objective moral values says nothing about how one might come to know these values, whether they're clear or so forth. Now, I think in many cases they are very clear. And what you'll find is that there really is a kind of moral code that underlies generally most cultures and societies throughout the world. Take even the example of cannibalism, for example. I'm told that by uh, anthropologists that even tribes that practice cannibalism actually do believe in the maxim, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But they don't regard people in other tribes as their neighbor. So they, can't, they are willing to cannibalize them, but they would not cannibalize somebody in their own tribe. They have a, a fundamental common moral uh, code, but there's, it's differently uh, retur uh, interpreted and culturally conditioned. Similarly, uh, other values may be uh, underlying these, uh, but they may have different cultural expressions. But in any case, the point is that on atheism, you see none of these things can be objectively condemned or praised because on atheism we are completely lost in socio-cultural relativism. We are just animals on the atheistic view and animals are not moral agents. So when Nazi war criminals or uh, uh, terrorists or uh, even Christians perpetrate, perpetrate atrocities, the atheist can no more condemn these than he can condemn uh, a lion uh, eating its young or a great white shark raping and copulating with a female. These kinds of actions like rape and uh, uh, murder uh, are, go on all the time in the animal kingdom, but they, they're not considered rape and murder because they have no moral quality to them. And if we are uh, in a world without God, we are just animals, and these have no moral quality for us either. Wow. I've been waiting to use that. Okay. <laughs> Can we have now we have the first question? Oh, sorry, sorry, you have a minute to reply, Daniel. Thank you, yes. Please go um, ahead. Yes, thank you, because there are two things that I'd like to say about that. The first thing is that Dr. Craig's response to this very good question seems to imply that you could exculpate anybody at all of any crime. Let us take, for example, the Nazis. If the cannibals were all right and they actually obeyed the Ten Commandments on the grounds that they didn't consider other tribes their neighbours, then equally we could say that the Nazis did not disobey the commandment not to kill because they didn't regard Jews as human beings. But clearly they didn't. The second point I want to make is, of course, that there isn't the slightest reason to think that 
moral values get their objectivity from our obligations to God? Or if there is, then why not just say moral values get their objectivity from our obligations to each other? Thank you, that's all. Fine, thank you. I think we can then move on to the second question. This one needs to be addressed to Arif. Yes. Could you, could you just repeat the question because I need to um, put it into the... Would you mind repeating the question as you understand yes. it? it the, the, me. Thank you. the question as I understood it was that I was being asked to distinguish between those things that I know, those things that I believe to be true and those things that I opine. Yes? Okay, well if I take the distinction between belief and opining simply to mean the distinction between beliefs that I hold firmly and beliefs that I hold tentatively, then I would say the things I know are the things for which I have empirical evidence, i.e. the testimony of my senses. The things that I believe are the things for which my senses give me some reason, reasonable degree of believing them, plus various other things that I happen to believe which I recognise to be unreasonable, as Hume showed. The things that I opine are various matters of speculation, so I may opine that it's going to rain tomorrow, and I certainly opine that Australia will win the ashes because I put a bit of money on it recently. Um, but <laughs> I hope those examples give you a, 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 an answer to the kind of thing you want. If the question is, do I know, believe, or opine in the existence of God, if that's the question, then my answer is, I have as good reason for not believing in God's existence as I have for anything. Fine, thank you. I think this might be a good opportunity for me to respond to the point about uh, the role of reason in knowing that God exists. I think what Dr. Ahmed did was really take my statements out of context in the book. What I'm defending there is what's been called a Holy Spirit epistemology, which says that on the basis of the witness of the Holy Spirit in one's heart, God gives you a veridical experience of himself, and that in the absence of some defeater of that, we are quite rational to accept that belief as true. Alvin Plantinga has defended this epistemology most eloquently in his book, Warranted Christian Belief. And uh, planning it gives the illustration of someone who is accused of a crime that he knows he didn't commit, even though all the evidence is against him, so that others would convict him if he were in a court of law. Planning says, must that person believe in his own guilt on the basis of the evidence, even though he knows he didn't do it? Well, obviously not. His uh, knowledge of his own innocence, uh, uh, it makes it rational for him to believe in his innocence despite the evidence. And my point was that given the way evidence shifts in history and different cultures and times, there may be times and places in history where the evidence turns against Christianity, but for a person who knows the Holy Spirit, that, that would be uh, an overriding uh, reason to believe. Fine. I think well, we lost the track of the time a tiny bit there, but um, probably only by about 10 or 15 seconds. Uh, we are on to the next question, uh, which is going to be addressed to you again, Bill. All right. So I'm looking, I think, probably from this side of the room this time. That's another question this time for, for Bill. Yes. Yes. Is God interested what? <laughs> Can you repeat the question? The, yes, he one? asked if God is interested in fine-tuning, is he interested in fine-tuning human minds? And the answer is no. Uh, God isn't interested in puppets or marionettes. He gives people freedom of the will to do as they should choose. But that doesn't escape this fine-tuning argument I gave, which is about the, in, the extraordinary fine-tuning of the universe uh, and its initial conditions for intelligent life. You simply cannot responsibly deny the fact of fine-tuning. As Martin Rees, the astronomer royal, said, I quoted him, this is everywhere in physics. John Barrow gives uh, the following illustration. He says, what you would do is represent our universe on a piece of paper as a red dot. Then you would alter slightly some of these constants and quantities, and that would be a new universe. If it's a life-permitting universe, you make it another red dot. If it's a life-prohibiting universe, you make it a blue dot. And then you do it again, and do it again, and do it again. 
And Barrow says, what you will find at the end of this exercise is a sheet of blue with only a couple of pinpricks of red. That's what is meant by the fine tuning. And this is a, this is a fact of science that you simply can't avoid. It, it's, it's indisputable. What, the question is, how do you best explain it? It can't be due to physical necessity because these are initial conditions. They're independent of the laws of nature. Notice I'm not talking about logical possibility. That was uh, Dr. Ahmed's only escape in his last rebuttal, that these are just logical possibilities. We're talking here about the physical range of possibilities for these constants and quantities. And then we're talking about the life-permitting range. And it's so extraordinary, this can't be explained either by natural necessity or by simple chance. So we're still left here without a good explanation from the atheist for the fine-tuning of the universe. I think the best explanation is the universe appears to be fine-tuned because it was. It, it was designed uh, by an intelligent, uh, transcendent uh, designer. Fine, thank you. Can I have uh, your response to that, please? Yes, Marie? thank you. Thank you. Um, briefly, I'll say the following things. First of all, uh, Dr. Craig, as we've seen, has yet again resorted to a metaphor. This time it was the metaphor of the little blue dots and the red dot on the, uh, on the piece of paper. I would like to see what that actually literally means. Typically, our evidence for saying that one thing is very unlikely or is very likely is through frequency on repeated trials. We haven't got any repeated trials, so why is it likely? The second point is that he says that I've made the mistake of appealing to logical rather than to physical probabilities, uh, sorry, physical possibilities. Um, and if you take all the physically possible universes, then you get uh, a much larger range. Well, that just seems to me to be fallacious. A, I don't see any reason to think all of these universes are physically possible. There may be cosmological theories on which they're not. And B, even in my coin example, I could give you as many physically possible ways the coin could land as you like. It could land on its side at one angle, it could land on its side at a slightly different angle, or at yet another slightly different angle. All of these things are physically possible equilibria state, states for the coin, and yet, there are millions of them. So, Dr. Craig can't get me on that one. Thank you. So, we're now on to uh, the next question, which is going to be um, addressed to Arif. Um, I can see somebody sitting here, and then I shall go to the back for my next group of questions. So, can I ask you to, uh, to ask yours? Thank you. the question again. Yes, the, the question as I understood it was, is there something which I believe that I know for certain, for example, that 2 plus 2 equals 4, and if it were the case that everybody who told me that I was wrong on that, um, would I change my mind? Okay, again, so was that, was that not quite right? Yes. Yes, okay, thank you. Can um, you repeat that bit again? Yes, well. the question was whether am I coming to a judgment on that or not would or would not be a human quality, yes. Okay, so there are three things I want to say to that. First of all, um, there are, of course, things that I know pretty much for certain, as certain as I can be. For example, that 2 plus 2 equals 4, and the reason that I know that 2 plus 2 equals 4 is simply because I've looked on my fingers, but another good reason, if you wanted one, really, was its logical provability, and I could show you, if you wanted, how it could be proved by logic. Uh, the second case, the second question would be, if it were the case that everybody else said I was wrong, would I think I was wrong? Well, even in a case like that, there are such things as herd instincts, there are such things as power of suggestion, there are very many cases, the Milgram experiment is one of them, where what happens is people behave or believe in certain ways simply because of the power of their fellows. Now, I can't speak for my own independence of mind in case of such adverse circumstances, and I wouldn't want to predict it. Um, the third thing that I uh, want to say is that even though that's so, that doesn't make it, in some cases, always rational to stick to what you're sure of. There are plenty of things that we're sure of, but we don't have the slightest reason to believe, I think. Uh, and therefore, it's simply a feature of our animal natures that we believe them. This is a slightly separate issue. I mean, I could discuss Hume, who showed this quite conclusively, I think, later on if you wanted. But the point I'm making now is that 
it is a regrettable but inevitable feature of our human nature that there are some things we believe but can't help believing. Religion isn't one of them. We can drop it. Thank you. Um, well, you have I, one minute. I don't have anything to say about that question, so let me use my minute to respond to what uh, Dr. Uh, Ahmed said in response to my argument from the beginning of the universe. He agrees with the first premise that anything that comes into being must have a cause. Now, has he given you any good reason to think that the universe uh, did not begin to exist? I gave the philosophical argument against the possibility of an actually infinite number of things, and he simply insisted here that uh, subtraction is not well defined for transfinite numbers. But the, the reason it's not is because you get self-contradiction. So this is prohibited with transfinite numbers, and I do know what I'm talking about here. But in reality, if things exist in reality, it's easy to subtract them. So this, it follows from that that avo to avoid contradictions, there cannot be an actual infinite number of things. Moreover, we've got tremendous evidence from contemporary cosmology for the origin of the universe from absolutely nothing. And every attempt to avoid this uh, has, has failed. So if Dr. Ahmed is really as open to the evidence as he claims that he is, he ought to believe that second premise that the universe began to exist. It is clearly more probable than it's contradictory. And it seems to me that he ought to therefore accept the existence of a transcendent creator. You just escaped my gong. <laughs> um, so the next question is going to come to you, um, Bill. And I'm going to look at the uh, back half of the audience this time. Yes. Um, with the fairer hair just behind in the red shirt. Yep. That's you. Yes. <laughs> Can you repeat the question? The question was, is God a, a loving God, or is he the source of all, including evil I itself? Certainly God is the source of everything that exists, but that doesn't mean that he is the creator of evil, because evil is not in itself a positive reality. Evil is the privation of goodness. Uh, to give an example in physics, cold has no positive reality. It's the privation or absence of heat. Uh, darkness has no positive reality. It's the privation or absence of light. Similarly, evil is the privation of goodness in the creaturely will, when it's not oriented toward God, but oriented toward finite goods. So it, that doesn't mean evil is illusory. It's a real privation, just as cold is a real privation when you go out on a cold winter's morning. It's real uh, in the sense that it's a real privation, but it doesn't have any positive sort of metaphysical reality. Now, what I want to say is that the sovereign God is over all of history, and he sovereignly directs history toward his foreseen ends. But it involves free creatures whom he allows to make their own free decisions, like to have wars, like World War I and so forth. But God, being ultimately in control, will arrive at his purposes through the free decisions of creatures, even sinful, evil decisions, so that ultimately his purposes will be accomplished. And it's impossible for us, limited within our limited framework, to say that when some evil happens, that God doesn't have an, a morally sufficient reason for permitting that. We're simply not in a position to make those judgments inductively. Atheists recognize this in other contexts. One of the problems with the utilitarian theory, which says we should always act to maximize the greatest good for the greatest number of people, is that we never know which of our actions might bring the greatest good for the greatest number of people. Some short-term boon should be, could prove disastrous in the long run. Some short-term uh, bad thing could be ultimately beneficial in the long run. So we can't make these judgments inductively, and that's why this argument from evil really, is fa really fails because it makes presumptuous probability judgments. One minute. Thank you. Um, well, I suppose the first thing to say is with regard to the uh, distinction uh, between positive qualities and 
privations. Look, this really is just a play with words. If there was a cookie jar and I took all the cookies out of it so that you didn't have any, and then you blamed me for emptying the cookie jar, it would not be a defense for me to say, well, I was the source of the emptiness in the cookie jar, but there's no positive quality of emptiness in the cookie jar. That's just a privation of cookies. That wouldn't be a defense. You'd punch me in the face if I said that. So I agree with Dr. Craig that God, being the source of all, is indeed the source of all evil. I disagree with him in thinking that there's any reason to exculpate him from that. The next point concerns Dr. Craig's appeal to free will. He said that we use free, he uses free creatures as a means for working out his ends. Now, it seems to me rather strange that if God is really so powerful, why did he have to rely on all these crotchets? Why did he have to rely on creatures who freely bring about holocausts? And sometimes he commands them to bring about holocausts in order to bring his own ends about. If he's so powerful, he doesn't need that. This is lively. Uh, the next question is addressed to Arif. And again, I'm going to take it uh, from somewhere near the back, I think from this side. Yes. Yes, the, the question was, what reason is there to think that the, the doctrine that the universe had no beginning is incompatible with the doctrine that the universe had a cause? Is that correct? Yes, okay. It seems to me there are two things to say about that. The first thing is that all the instances of causation that we're acquainted with are causation in time. Now, I don't mean by that necessarily that the cause always precedes the effect, though in almost all cases it does. When you switch on a light, at a light switch, the light goes on almost instantaneously, but in fact it's not quite instantaneous. It takes a tiny millionth of a second to turn on. Maybe sometimes there are cases of simultaneous causation. I don't know. In any case, it's true that the cause and the effect are always both events in time. We have no acquaintance with any events in which one thing which exists outside of time, if I can understand what that means, causes something in time. But the second point, which is really more important, is that I, of course, never claimed, and nothing in my argument rests on the claim, that the statement that the universe never had a beginning entails that it never had a cause. All that I'm claiming is that Dr. Craig has given us not the slightest reason to think that the universe had a beginning. And in response to his remarks that he made about transfinite numbers just now, I will repeat what I've said for the third time now. Could he please tell us which part of the five little words, every event followed another one, he doesn't understand. It's perfectly consistent that that should be so, and if it is so, there was never a first event. Thank you. Bill, you have one minute. Uh, Arif, I, I just don't understand why you think this is such a powerful objection. Every event follows another one. I, I would say that's simply a false statement, that there can be a first event which doesn't follow any prior event. In fact, that's what modern cosmology believes. Modern cosmology thinks that the Big Bang was not preceded by anything. So I'd like to know why in the world you think that principle is true. I, I don't see any reason to think that every event follows another one. Uh, it, it, it contradicts Big Bang cosmology, and we've got good reasons to think that there cannot be an actually infinite uh, regressive event. So if you're really a sincere seeker after truth, I, I, I don't understand why you're so uh, adamant in rejecting this second premise that the universe began to exist, which has both good philosophical and scientific evidence for it. Let me also address this question, why would God rely on these free creatures to achieve his ends? Because his ends are to bring free creatures into a loving relationship with himself Sorry, for eternity. I have eternity. to finish that one later. All right. <laughs> um, the next question, though, is coming to you. Um, right at the back. Yes, that's you. Yeah. 
Yeah. Sorry, I think probably the question is clear. Um, yeah. Bill, can you repeat it? Yeah. The, do you want me to repeat it, you say? Yeah. Okay. The, the question is, how can one be sure that science will not ultimately come to give an account of the fine-tuning, uh, as in the past uh, it's given account of other phenomena that seemed extraordinary in nature? Well, this is, uh, of course, uh, the uncertainty that's involved in any sort of scientific argument. And one wonders, is there, are there reasonable prospects to think that these initial conditions might be explained by physical necessity? Remember, that was the one alternative, in addition to chance, is could there be some physical necessity? And I think the pattern of discoveries here with regard to the fine-tuning makes it very unlikely that any final theory will ultimately be able to do away with the fine-tuning. Uh, Ernan McMullen, who is a prominent philosopher of science who has written on this, says the following. He says, it seems safe to say that later theory, no matter how different it may be, will turn up approximately the same numbers. And the numerous constraints that have to be imposed on these numbers seem both too specific and too numerous to evaporate entirely. A dozen or more constraints have been pointed out. Might they all be replaced? It surely seems a very long shot. So I think most theorists think that even the final theory, you know, the, the ultimate theory of everything, a unified theory of forces, is still going to involve uh, a fine tuning and that um, therefore it's very improbable that uh, we will have, uh, we'd be able to show that this is physical necessity. The constants are too numerous, uh, too specific to think they're all going to just vanish by some ultimate theory. Uh, and so they really do cry out for explanation uh, and I don't think can just be just sort of wished away. If we go on the basis of empirical probability, which is one of Dr. Ahmed's principles, I think as the evidence stands now, it is, it is uh, highly probable that the universe has fine-tuning and cannot be explained by physical necessity. We need some other explanation. Yes, Arif, one minute. Thank you. Um, well, I'll begin by addressing the last point. Um, the only source of empirical evidence that we have for assigning one likelihood rather than another is repeated trials. If I have a die and it's got six sides, we might say it's got a chance of one-sixth of coming out with a six. But supposing you roll it 20 times and it comes out six every time, you'll think it's probably loaded. You can't simply establish these probabilities a priori. And if you strip away all the metaphors and the appeals to authority, Dr. Craig has given us not the slightest reason to think we have any previous empirical trials. I turn now to the issue about cosmology. I agree with the questioner that, uh, with something that was implied by the question, that Big Bang cosmology is, I guess, I don't know enough about it to, to be authoritative, but I guess one of the most speculative parts of science that there is. We really just don't know what new observations we'll bring. We really just don't know if, in the end of the day, we'll end up with a Big Bang theory or a steady state theory or something else. At the moment, we just don't know. The last thing I'll say is to repeat a point which Dr. Craig still seems not to understand, which is simply that the doctrine that the universe and time itself began 15 billion years ago makes it highly misleading and distorting to say that if you don't believe in God, the universe came out of nothing. <laughs> I gave you an extra 10 seconds. <laughs> so we're on to the last question, I'm afraid, um, which is going to be addressed to um, Arif, and then there's going to be a three-minute summary from both sides to finish off. So one last question. I'm going to take it from the lady up there. Could you repeat the question a little bit more slowly, please? Thank you. Can you repeat the question? Yes, the question was that the questioner disagreed with the example I gave, the example being the one concerning Iranian children being sent across minefields during the Iran-Iraq war. And she said that that involves a confusion of the distinction between moral values that emanate from God and religion being used for various social purposes. That's the correct summary, isn't it, of your question? Okay, thank you. I agree with the distinction. Of course, it's true that we have to distinguish between the moral imperatives and objectives that are entailed by belief in God and whatever various uses 
these moral objectives and imperatives are put to. For example, the Roman Catholic Church, I believe, was a stalwart defender of fascism, um, and indeed the present Pope served a Nazi government, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the Bible itself has consequences which are in favour of fascism, though I wouldn't definitely rule out that it didn't. Um, despite the fact that the distinction is a good one, it nevertheless remains the case that if you believe in an afterlife, there is no particular reason to value this life. If you're flying a plane into a skyscraper and you think that when you fly it into the skyscraper you're going to go to heaven and have 72 virgins to do what you want with, well, that's a pretty good reason, I think, for a lot of poor, dispossessed people to go and fly planes into skyscrapers. And that's a reason that flows from religious beliefs, not from social manipulation of religion. Thank you. That's all. Bill, you have one minute. The reason that you value this life on Christian theism is because this life is a preparation for eternal life. You're going to spend eternity somewhere, and this life is the veil of decision-making in which you will determine your eternal destiny. And so this life is extraordinarily important in what you do uh, during this lifetime. And to point to misuses of, of religion only underlines human perversity of it shows that the best and most beautiful things in life are twisted by human beings to their own evil ends. And that doesn't do anything to disprove God. But remember, on the atheistic view, we're just animals. And therefore, there are no objective moral values. There are no right and wrong. You can't condemn anybody. You can't condemn the Nazi war criminal, the South African uh, apartheid, the racist, the Ku Klux Klanner, uh, even the American crusade against evil. None of this can be condemned on the atheistic view because there aren't any objective values. <laughs> you just escaped. So now um, we're going to have a summary. First uh, three minutes from Bill, then three minutes from Arif, um, and that's going to uh, conclude um, the debate this evening. So, Bill, uh, please take your three minutes. We'll time you from when you start at the lectern. All right. Well, I've enjoyed the debate tremendously tonight, and I hope that you have as well. In my final statement, I want to say something more about uh, religious experience. Because I myself wasn't raised in a Christian home uh, or even a church-going family. But when I became a teenager, I began to ask what I call the big questions in life. What's the purpose of my existence? What is the meaning of life? And in the answer, I began to, uh, in the search for answers, I began to attend a local church in our community. But instead of answers, all I found was a sort of social country club where the uh, dues were a dollar a week in the offering plate. And the other student who, who claimed to be Christians on Sunday lived for their real God the rest of the week, which was popularity. And that really bothered me because I thought, here I feel so spiritually empty inside, and yet I'm living externally a better life than these people are, and they claim to be Christians. They're all a bunch of hypocrites. And so I became very bitter toward the institutional church. And soon this attitude spread toward other people. I said, they're all hypocrites. They're all phonies. Uh, and and I, I wanted nothing to do with them. I, was, I threw myself into my studies. I was on my way to becoming, frankly, a very alienated young man. And I don't know if you know what this is like, but this sort of anger and despair just eats away at your insides day after day, making every day miserable, another day to get through. And I walked into my high school German class one day and sat down behind a girl who's one of these types, you know, that's always so happy. It just makes you sick. And I tapped her on the shoulder and she turned around and I said to her, Sandy, what are you always so happy about anyway? And she said, well, Bill, it's because I know Jesus Christ as my personal savior. And I said, well, I go to church. And she said, that's not enough, Bill. You've got to have him really living in your heart. And I said, well, what would you want to do a thing like that for? And she said, because he loves you, Bill. And that hit me like a ton of bricks, that the God of the universe would care about me and love me. That lit a fire within me. I began to read the New Testament. And as I did so, I was captivated by the person of Jesus of Nazareth. There was a ring of truth about his teachings and an authenticity about his life that I couldn't deny. Well, to make a long story short, after about six months of the most intense soul-searching, I realized the reason God seemed so unreal to me was because I was alienated from Him through my own moral failure and, and sin. And at the end of those six months, I simply cried out to God and yielded my life to Him. 
And as I did so, I felt this tremendous infusion of, of joy, like a balloon being blown up until it was ready to burst. I rushed outside. It was a warm evening. You could see the Milky Way from horizon to horizon. And I thought, God, I've come to know God. And God became a living reality for me in that moment, a reality that I've walked with now for, uh, year by year for over 30 years. And I believe this is a reality that anyone can find who will seek him with an open heart and an open mind. As we've looked at the arguments tonight, I think there are clearly good arguments for existence of God. And the arguments on the other side, I think, are not at all compelling. I find that uh, Christian faith, Christian relationship with God meets not only the demands of my head, but also the demands of my heart. And if you were to ask me why I believe in God, I would give you not only the arguments from the beginning of the universe, the fine-tuning, the existence of objective moral values, the historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus, but also the undeniable reality of his, uh, of his presence in my own life, a reality that I think any of us can find if we will simply seek him with an open mind and an open heart. And so I would encourage you to do just that. Interests of fairness, Arif, you have three minutes and 20 seconds. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I want to conclude then uh, just by backing up a little and going over some of the arguments we've been looking at tonight. I said that I had three arguments for believing that God doesn't exist. The first one, I said, was the burden of proof. Dr. Craig, I think, initially misunderstood this and don't involve a logical fallacy. In fact, all it involves is the fact that if there is no reason to believe in something, then that's a reason not to believe in it. And we've still seen no reason to doubt that principle. The second argument was what I call the problem of evil. And as we know, this is a traditional argument for believing that God doesn't exist. It seems to me that Dr. Craig's only defense, and this is one that he clung to, was that we just can't know at the end of the day, what's going to be good and what's going to be bad, what's going to be best for us and what isn't. Now, there are two forms that view might take. You might take the view that we just don't know what's going to be good for us in the next life, or you might take the view that we don't know what's going to be best for us in this life. The first version of that is obviously question begging. The whole issue that we're addressing tonight is whether there is a God who brings us back to life after we die. We can't start assuming that and then say, oh, things are going to be better in that life. That's completely circular. The second version, which is the view that we don't know what's going to be best for us and what's going to be worst for us uh, in this life, and therefore we can't tell or can't be certain that God has created or permitted gratuitous evils. That view, I will repeat, seems to me to be absurd. We can know as well as we can know anything in the moral sphere that there are some things that were wrong, that were harmful, and that were gratuitously wrong. I gave the example of the First World War and the Spanish flu that followed it. I could unfortunately give you millions more examples. The final argument was that religion results in a twisted moral universe. And I believe that this remains true. Dr. Craig pointed to the fact that there are some people who twist religions to their own ends. And I don't doubt that. There certainly are people who twist religion to their own ends. But that just because somebody has moral views which we find repulsive doesn't mean that they've twisted religion to their own ends. Just read what the Word of God says. Just read what the Bible says. Read the clear injunctions that you find in all the scriptures of many religions, though not all, across the world. They typically involve killing people who don't believe in the same thing as you. They typically involve an afterlife, which means that this life, being less valuable, is one which in many circumstances should be sacrificed, and indeed that of others should be sacrificed. I think it's quite plausible that the Crusades have a very good theological justification. I think it's quite plausible that if the Israeli Defense Force really believes the Old Testament, it's justified in shooting school children. 
I think the people who threw planes into the World Trade Center were justified in thinking they were doing something for their religion. Dr. Craig has given us no reason to doubt these propositions, so I remain convinced of my third point, that religious beliefs warp our moral worldview. That concludes the three arguments that I have against religion. Thank you.